confines of economics, and his contributions to the intellectual world are too many to count. With that in mind, I would like you all to join me in welcoming Dr. Robert Murphy. Thanks, Noah. Uh, thanks, everyone, for uh, coming out tonight. Do we? Is this okay? Yeah. Um, so just to let you know, I'm gonna. We have the uh, old-fashioned clicker where, and I'm gonna just keep signaling to him, and he's gonna have to manually advance because the clicker's not working. So it's okay if I'm boring. You guys start to doze off, but if he dozes off, we're dead in the water. So I'm gonna try to be lively. So what I'm talking to you today about is free market healthcare. Go ahead. Uh, so let me start by explaining the conventional economic case. So I'm an economist, I'm going to be focusing on things from the point of view of, of economic theory here, but then give you real world um, applications of these principles. So a lot of what I'm going to do here is focus on specific interventions by the government into the healthcare sector. And that's one of the things that let me just reveal part of the punchline is we say we don't have a free market in healthcare. And so to the extent that I think most people can agree that something's not quite right with the current healthcare system, that uh, it's, it's certainly not correct to say, oh, well, that's because we have the free market and you know, we should try something else, okay? So that's, so what I wanna do though is, is explain why is it that, are you guys tweaking the sound a little bit? Okay, uh, is explain why is it that a standard economist would say, you know, why is it that we don't have, well, why shouldn't we just let the market be in charge of healthcare delivery. Okay, the way if it came to like TVs or cars, something like that, people would be, you know, fine. So again, you don't want the government providing that, you have the, the market to do that. So the case starts with Nobel laureate Kenneth Arrow. So let me just summarize for you um, his, go ahead. So he had this article that came out in the American Economic Review in 1963. So you don't know that, so that's one of the leading economics journals, so go ahead. And one of the major, so I'm, I'm summarizing here, obviously it was a technical economics article, and he's, he's a Nobel laureate in economics, and so he, this article is one that nowadays if you ask a random economist, hey, how come we don't just have laissez-faire, just, you know, why isn't the market for healthcare like the market for pizza shops or the market for TVs, they would probably say, well, as Arrow showed back in 63, there's some important differences between the market for healthcare delivery versus, you know, consumer electronics or automobiles, things like that. So, so here I'm summarizing you know, his technical arguments in the, in the layman's language. So he said, first of all, there's major predictable expenses, and also there's an asymmetry of information. Okay, so the, the major unpredictable expenses, obviously he's referring to the fact that you could just all of a sudden get sick and not know it's coming. And you wouldn't necessarily, so it's not something, it's not like paying for your kid's college, right, where you know that there's something coming, although the parents in the room will know that the expense was still unpredictable no matter how much you set aside. You can't believe how much it was by the time your kid went to college. But still, you, you know that's out there looming. You have years to get ready for it. Whereas if you all of a sudden get hit with cancer and you have all these big treatments or you get into a car accident, you know that's, that's not something where you necessarily could easily plan for that. And the asymmetry of information, so that asymmetry is a fancy word, just, whoops, <laughs> just, okay. Testing, okay. And the asymmetry of information is talking about the fact that uh, there's various levels of expertise in this area. Okay, so you go, it, it, it's not like um, you know, you're buying pizza, you know whether or not you like it. Okay, it's pretty pretty straightforward. Even something like buying a car, you know, you can go do research, whereas here, <laughs> that's a skill I have to make that noise. Um, if you have a, uh, you're going to go buy a new car or something like that. You can go do research. Whereas you're going to go get cancer treatment that's a very technical subject. It's not something that you can easily just uh, you know, talk to the doctor and know what this deal is and to say whether or not you think that, oh yeah, is that treatment really worth $38,000? It's hard for you as a regular medical patient. Plus you might be sick, right? And so it might be hard for you to make these deliberative choices. So these are some of the main reasons that Arrow was saying the standard argument by which most economists would say, yeah, markets are pretty good day in and day out for food and TVs and cars. They're not very good when it comes to healthcare, and that's why Arrow would say there's a big role for government provision in this area. Okay. So what I want to just you know, point out here is, really though, Arrow, this, 
this case, he has not proven that, oh, that's why we should trust the government or the, you know, the, the political system rather than the market for healthcare. All he's really done is shown, here are some reasons that we wouldn't expect the market to deliver healthcare as smoothly and frictionlessly in, uh, for healthcare as it does with pizzas or cars, right? So he hasn't actually shown that the government's better. And so, for example, the fact that the asymmetry of information, so yeah, that's a real thing, but on the other hand, how, do, how does it overcome that problem, that limitation, because we have the political system do it, right? So again, Arrow is saying correctly, it's the, the case for the, the market, or that the market doesn't work as effectively, perhaps, when it comes to healthcare because patients don't know about leukemia the way they know about if they, if they like that TV they bought. They can look at the color, they can tell whether they like it or not, they can go to their friend's house and see it, where it's a lot harder when it comes to a treatment for a rare disease for the consumer to be informed and make decisions and know whether they're getting ripped off, the quality's worth it, and so on. That's true, but how does it fix that problem? How is it a response to that? Say, okay, so that's what we need the government Maybe I'll just switch to the, uh, I'll, take, I'll turn this off, and I'll switch to that. That's right with you guys, just because that's going to be true. That's fine. Okay. Check, check, okay. And then we can go into karaoke if you'd like. <laughs> okay. So notice, how does, it, how does it solve the problem by having the government take that over? Okay, because think about it, you're saying, yeah, consumers, they don't know about leukemia treatments, they don't know about these things. Some doctor could be, you know, a fly-by-night operation, a crank, that's true. So instead, we're gonna solve this by having periodic elections, and then, you know, every two years or every four years, we're gonna have a popular vote, and then one of two candidates both of whom probably don't know much more about medicine than the average voter does, you know, except for like Ron Paul or somebody, then they're gonna go and they're gonna what, have to appoint some experts who are then going to you know, regulate and give licenses to doctors, right? So that, that's how the government ostensibly fixes this problem of, of low information or asymmetry of information is they have medical licensing and things like that. But again, how does that actually work? Ultimately, like, in other words, what if the government what if the licensing boards put in place people, you know, gave medical licenses to quacks, right? Or, or if they denied licenses to really qualified medical professionals, how, how would we know, right? I guess, you know, there'd be doctors doing bad things. And so ultimately, the public would have to go then vote differently in the next election if they didn't approve of the medical licenses that were granted in the system that the politicians created and the politicians were in office because of the past history of elections. So if you think through the, the logic of how is it that the general public ensures the quality of care and medicine through the political system because of this issue that the voters don't really know that much about it, you see that this, the system of control is actually much more tenuous and dubious when it comes to the political system. Because, In other words, if it would work to rely on elections to be the ultimate check on bad doctors, well then it would also work on just having the market competition. All right, so I'll come back to this point later and give you like more uh, specific examples in the real world of, of this kind of thing in action. But I'm just pointing out, it's not enough just to say, I can come up with some reasons that the market doesn't work with healthcare as effortlessly as it does with yogurt or, or milk. That you have to take it one step further and say, to justify government intervention because of that issue, what reason do we have to think the government's gonna solve it? Um, also, as far as major unpredictable expenses, Yes, there, that is an issue, but there's a, there's a market mechanism to deal with, namely insurance. Okay, if you get into a car crash with your, you know, your car, you have car insurance, right? So that's a major unpredictable expense. And so it's not that the government is in charge of car repairs and that there's a huge program analogous to Medicare or Medicaid that deals with uh, refunding all the people who get in the automobile accidents. No, you just have insurance, and that's, one, that's the way the market deals with major unpredictable expenses is people have insurance policy. So that, that's the way the market would deal with these things. Okay, go ahead. So as I say, we don't have a free market in healthcare. Go ahead. And let me just 
illustrate with some uh, two examples from the real world here. So I was working on a book called The Primal Prescription. I did it with an ER doctor, Doug McGuff, if, you, if you're interested in this topic and want to read more on it. And um, when we were doing the research, so I started paying attention to in the news when they were talking about medical issues. And I came across this story. That it was like she was like an NPR reporter or something like that. So she worked for a, a, a radio program and uh, she, she was pregnant. And so she just, out of curiosity, was, you know, she was doing a story on healthcare costs. And so she called around to all the local hospitals just to get a quote to say, you know, say look, if I came in and had a regular delivery, no complications, how much when all said and done would, it, would the bill be? Okay, so um, I don't have the exact number off the top of my head. I think it was around eight places she called. And seven of them refused to give her a number at all. One of them gave her a number and said, assuming no complications, a standard delivery, it would probably be about this much, but that's not an official quote. You can't hold us to that. If you came in and had your baby here, you know, the, the bill might be higher. Okay, so in other words, she, she was not getting a number from anybody. Next one. Something that happened to me about a month ago, I had to get a, a blood test. I was curious about something. I just wanted to test for a particular thing. And so I asked my doctor, I said, hey, can you schedule that? He said, sure. And he mentioned to me, he said, hey, I don't know if your insurance is going to cover this, so you might, before you go in and have them do this and you get hit with a, an unexpected bill, you might want to just check and see how much it is. So I said, oh, okay. And so I called, uh, I think, four separate people, you know, called the first person, like the, the place that scheduled the, the test and was going to administer it. I said, how much is this going to cost? They said, I don't know. I said, okay, well, who would? They gave me a name, called that person who didn't know, gave me a name. I finally got someone on the phone. And by the way, these people were all very pleasant. I'm not like saying like, oh, these bureaucrats. That's it. They were very, it was, um, it was down in Texas. Everyone was very friendly and friendly down there. And, but I finally got someone and she, she said something like, uh, I, I don't know how much it is. I think, I think you can go ahead and do it because it's not, it's, it's not, it's not going to be that much. I said, oh, okay, I guess worst case scenario, my insurance doesn't cover it, I'll just pay cash. She goes, yeah, okay. And I'm about to hang up. She goes, yeah, I mean, I doubt it would be more than $400. <laughs> and, you know, I mean, maybe she just, but by the sound of my voice, she thought I was a well to do person. But, you know, that was more than I was expecting. And I said, well, okay. It turned out it wasn't, it was like $186, something like that. But their point is, they couldn't tell me how much this thing was going to be. Next one. So, again, just really, I ask you to just stop for a second and really take this thought experiment seriously. Can you imagine you're going to buy a car and you call all the dealerships in your town, all the places you're thinking about getting a car, and you describe the model. You say, yeah, I'm, you know, I'm on a, the, the Nissan 2019. I'm thinking about this. You have these, these features. And you describe it. Yeah, we got it in stock and everything. Sure thing. Yeah, you can come down and test drive it. And you say, how much is it? And they tell you, we'll let you know after you buy the car how much it costs in all the place, all the dealerships tell you that. Okay, just think through, imagine if in America that was the standard rule that everybody was buying cars, or I know some of you guys, if, if you're not in the market for cars, if the new iPhone comes out and you're thinking about getting it, imagine if wherever you go to buy your phones, they said we're not gonna tell you how much it is. You have to first buy it, then we will tell you how much it costs. Can you possibly imagine what the market for that would look like? Clearly things would be a lot more expensive than they are, and the quality probably would be more hit or miss. Okay, and I'm saying that is what medicine really is like in the United States right now. So say what you will, I'm not here, by me pointing this out, I'm not making the case for a free market in healthcare. I'm just pointing out that's certainly not what we have right now. And so when people, and you, you get this a lot, like I do a lot of consulting work with Canadians, and they have this idea that, oh yeah, there's the Wild West down in the United States, and in the, in the U.S., it's a free market in healthcare. It's you know there's sick people who, who die on the street because it's it's such a rugged individualist culture. Thank goodness here in Canada we have the government to do that. And so number one, it's actually interesting. The U.S. government at all levels pays the same percentage of the economy for healthcare expenses as the Canadian government does. So it is true that the U.S. has a private component, but that. All that spending is over and above the level that the Canadian government spends, right? So there's, there's that element. But either way, my point is what the U.S. has right now is clearly not a market in healthcare because, again, imagine any other market you know if you had to buy stuff and they, after you purchased it, you were on the hook legally, then they told you how much it was. That would be crazy. You, you might even think, that how could that work? But, I mean, if, if it were a car market, that's how it worked 
people would still buy cars because cars are so useful. So likewise here with healthcare, even though it's a crazy system, you know, it's better getting healthcare than not having it at all. So that's why it, it lingers along. And the, but I'm just trying to give you a hint here as to why is it so expensive? Yeah. Okay, let me uh, mention real quickly here. I, again, I, I know for some of you, if it's, you know, you're still like on your parents' insurance, this might not ring as true for you, but at least file it away. And as you, know, as you move on and you start getting your own insurance, this might ring more true to you. But health insurance, it's not like other forms of insurance. Okay, so your car insurance, you have that in place in case you get into an accident. And that's the rare time, you know, or somebody dings your car in the parking lot or something, you get a scratch, you consider, do I want to call this in the insurance company? That's when you use your car insurance. It's when you have a major expense that's out of the ordinary, and then you submit the claim to them. You don't call your insurance company for your car when you get an oil change, right? It's not that you go and get an oil change or get new tires, and then you get the receipt, and it has one price for how much the tires originally cost, and then insurance adjustment, and how much now do you owe. That's not how insurance works. Or if your house burns down, that's when your fire insurance for homeowners kicks in. It's not a standard thing that to get new uh, smoke alarms, your fire insurance company covers that cost. Okay, so that's one huge difference. Whereas in, in health insurance, that is how it works, right? When you, when you, just about anything you get done, like I said, that last procedure for the blood test, they were warning me, hey, you know, your insurance might not cover this, so you might actually care about the cost. Okay, so what happens is because health insurance is so expensive, or sorry, health care is so expensive, most people now do not just pay out of pocket for their even standard procedures, just routine checkups and things like that to go to the doctor for. They'll have what's called a copay, and that's the part that you're on the hook for. So what ends up happening perversely is regular people, when they're making like, the doctor says, "Hey, why don't you go get these tests done?" You know, like, "Oh man, my shoulder's sore," and the doctor says, "Oh, okay, you know what? I'm going to send you down. Why don't you go get some X-rays and here, go and do this and go to, and he gives you a bunch of stuff." Most people just go do it. Say, well, because my doctor said to. They don't stop and say to them, how much will this cost somebody? Right? Because they know I'm not going to pay it. If I get some invoice that says that x ray was $400, you know, I'm not paying that. That's not coming out of my checking account balance. My insurance company picks it up. That's why I have insurance. And so that's, you know, it's individually rational, but when everybody in the country is doing that, that means there are a lot more x rays done at really high prices that really aren't medically necessary. Okay? So, Again, that's that's the that's part of what's going on here is there's a lot more people paying for healthcare procedures that if the actual patient, for example, if your physician said to you, here, why don't you go get this X-ray done, and then and you said, well, how much is it? And he said, whatever, it'll be six hundred dollars, and you said, well, what if instead I didn't get that done and I could just get five hundred dollars in cash? You know, should I do that? You know, the, the, and the doctor explained to you what the the actual benefit, what are the chances I have something that the sex ray is going to pick up, that sort of thing. You know, most people in those types of scenarios, a lot of the things they get done, they would much rather just get even half of the money as cash than go get the procedure done when they when it was explained to them even by their doctor, by someone they trust. Well, here's the benefits of doing that, and partly why the doctor would order. A whole battery of stuff, even though he would know, yeah, chances are this isn't going to pick anything up, but just to, be, is be, to shield himself from a lawsuit, right? That if if you did happen to have something and he didn't say go get all these tests done, then you could come back or your family, you know, if you died, to come back and sue him. So again, these are all tricky things, and it's hard in any given case. And I'm not a medical doctor, so it's not, I'm not here second guessing doctors, but I'm saying it is well understood in this area that there's plenty of they. They err on the side of ordering more tests to cover themselves. Because again, it's rational for any individual doctor to go ahead and do that because they're not, they're not paying for it. So that's part of what's happening here, why healthcare is so expensive, is that the people who are making the decisions are not the ones bearing the cost of doing so. Okay, uh, look at this middle, whoop, whoop, back. Whoop, there you go. Um, so this middle one now, just again, I'm, I'm explaining the difference when we're trying to understand what's screwy about the healthcare, health insurance sector. I'm pointing out this isn't a problem about insurance. There's something weird about health insurance. Okay, so I'm contrasting with other types of insurance in the real world right now. So this is not me describing this utopia, free market, capitalist system. 
compared to today. I'm saying right now in this world, look at actual health insurance versus other types of insurance. So you can see there's a difference. And so it's not just that you know I'm, I'm holding up some textbook model that isn't isn't realistic. So right now, you know, you're, you're talking to your friend and they say, and you say, hey, we're gonna go to this party that's across town, you wanna go? I say, no, I can't because I'm in between jobs. And like, what, what does that have to do with it? You say, oh, because I don't have car insurance right now, so I can't drive until I get a new job. Nobody talks like that, that would be weird. You say, what, your car insurance has nothing to do, whereas people do say, oh yeah, I'm, I, you know, I got this pain, and I'm, I'm gonna have a procedure done to take care of it at some point, but right now I'm in between jobs, so I can't do it because I don't have health insurance. That sounds totally normal in the United States, or at least it did until the Affordable Care Act. Now it's not as normal, but clearly there are lots of people who postpone things because, oh yeah, I'm in between jobs, I don't have insurance, when they need health insurance. Because in the United States, health insurance tends to be tied to your employer, and I'll explain why that is in a minute, but other forms of insurance aren't. With other jobs, it's not that they say, oh yeah, come work for us because we have great car insurance benefits. Nobody talks like that in a job interview, but they will say, oh, we have great health benefits, by which they mean we have a good health insurance plan. Okay, another difference between conventional insurance and health insurance is, like, if you get in a, a car accident, you know, someone smashes and totals your car, and then the insurance adjuster comes out, takes pictures, and they say, okay, yeah, we owe you $12,000, right? So you get a check for $12,000 from the car insurance company to compensate you for the damage to your vehicle, you could just deposit that money. You don't need to buy a new car. You don't need to get any work done because what the insurance is doing is making you whole from the loss you suffered. That's what insurance does. Okay, or if your house burned down and the homeowners, you know, they gave you the check for that, you don't need to rebuild the exact same house. You're just being compensated. You know, and obviously with life insurance, if somebody dies and you get a check, you don't have to pay to get a clone made of the person who's dead, right? It's just you're getting compensated. Right? So I'm saying the principle that what happens in insurance is you get money to help compensate you for your loss. You don't need to go use that money to try to repair the damage per se. And obviously in life insurance, that wouldn't even make sense, okay? But with life insurance, it isn't like, or sorry, with health insurance, it isn't like that. With health insurance, typically, it's the insurance companies dealing with the medical professionals and they're the ones doing all the negotiating and paying money to each other. You're very rarely the one getting the check. And even if you do get it, it's always after the services are rendered. It's not that you say, oh, wow, I got a pain here. And then, you know, someone from the health insurance company comes and looks at it and says, oh, yeah, that would, that would cost $700 to have someone treat that. Here's money. You can get it treated or you can go buy ice cream if you want. You, you, you don't have the freedom to do that, right? That would be weird. That would be scandalous. But that is how other types of insurance work. Okay, so again, I'm just showing you that the, the patient or the consumer has a lot less power in these negotiations. That part of what's going on here is the patient is not really the customer. You as a, as a patient are like a nuisance and it's the health insurance companies or the government who are paying for the procedures and it's the hospitals or you know the, the surgery centers, the ones that are providing it and charging the money and it's those big behemoths that are battling over you know the fate of thousands of people, and you're kind of like a little cog in the machine. You're not. You only have much control over it. Whereas these other sectors, you still are the locus of decision making. You're the one. It's, you know, you're the paying one paying for car insurance. If you get into an accident, they're making you whole, and you can do what you want with the money. Okay. Okay. So I'm. I spent some time here just trying to like warm you up to seeing how there's differences in these markets. So now let me try to give you a little bit of the history, and I'm going to leave time at the end for your questions, a little bit of the history. How did we get to this point? Okay, go ahead. So in 1910, there was this thing called the Flexner Report calling for higher medical school standards. Go ahead. From 19, so after this report came out, I just want to give you a statistic, so from 1900 to 1930, licensing of schools caused 30 medical schools to close. Okay, so in other words, this Flexner report said there's, there's substandard medical schools in the country. We need to have beef up the standards. And so because of that, now the, the political process got involved first at the state level and then ultimately the federal level. And because of that, some schools didn't pass you know, the new standards. And so they closed down. Next one. And so in that same period, it started out that there were 175 physicians per 100,000 people. And that dropped down to about 125. Okay, so 
it, it may very well be that you know that difference of 50 physicians out of 100,000 that now fell, fell out of it and went to other occupations because they couldn't get a, a degree or they couldn't get licensed once the state started putting in you know actual laws. Uh, just, just to make sure you get what I'm saying here. So if the government insists on a license, that means if you get caught practicing medicine without a license, they will punish you. Whereas there was a period where it was, it was all voluntary, where anybody could be a doctor and you, you relied on word of mouth, reputation, things like that. It wasn't though that the, that the government had the authority to send the police to punish you if you got caught practicing without a license, whereas this movement started bringing in mandatory licensure. Okay, so an obvious result of this move or this, this revolution, this drive, was to reduce the amount of practicing physicians per person in the, in the population. Of course that would happen. Next one. So let me just spend a minute to explain Milton Friedman's Cadillac analogy here. So the idea is, are you helping the public if the government comes in and sets in minimum standards of quality? And, and so Friedman was, was using this more broadly, but we're here I'm talking about it in terms of just this issue of medical professionals. So let's assume, just for the sake of argument, that the government really is competent at like, relying on good experts to advise them to say these are the standards of what a good medical school should be. And by the way, we don't have time to get into it here, but there are plenty of people in what's um, like homeopathic care and you know, other forms of non-traditional Western medicine treatments that some of you may be familiar with. You know, they start getting real popular now. Um, they, there's been a resurgence of this stuff. But a lot of them were, were pushed out, right? So you know, there was a power struggle at this period to define what is good, acceptable, quality, high care medicine and what's quackery. You know, what, what's the stuff that will fool the public. It's not really medicine. It's not based on sound science. And so it's not obvious that you would want to trust the political authorities to make those decisions. But that, that is what happens if they, get, if they have to grant licenses. They have to decide who's a good doctor and who's a quack. And so that's an open question, and a lot of people in, you know, that alternative, like things like acupuncture and stuff like that, you know, there's varying opinions as to is that really good medicine versus, you know, shooting somebody up with pharmaceuticals, that kind of stuff. All right, so people have different views of that, and I'm just saying if you have medical licensing, you're giving the government the power to make those decisions. But let's assume that that's not an issue. Let's assume it's pretty straightforward who's a better doctor and who isn't. And if the government comes in and says, you need to be this good or better to be allowed to practice, or else it's illegal, is that obviously helping the public? And so Milton Friedman had this Cadillac analogy where he said, imagine if the government said, uh, in order to sell a car, it has to be at least as good as a Cadillac. What would happen is it's pretty obvious if you think that through, that would hurt a lot of people, right? In particular, the people who can't afford Cadillacs or they could afford it, but it, you know they really have to cut back on other areas of their lifestyle, and would end up choosing not to, and they would end up taking the bus. All right, so it's true. Everybody, when the dust settled, if they put that kind of a rule in place, the people who still were driving would be in really nice cars. That's true, but they could have been in nice cars anyway. Right? It's not that the government's making Cadillacs available, so anybody who wanted to spend the money to drive a Cadillac could have done that before this crazy rule. All the rule would be doing is saying those who would have chosen to buy a cheaper car, even though it's not as good as a Cadillac, because they wanted to free up money for you know their kid's education or go on vacation or whatever, or just because they don't make enough money, they really can't afford a Cadillac without sacrificing their rent or something, those people now have to take the bus or ride a bike. So it's not obvious that you're helping anybody, and you're clearly hurting poorer people who presumably are the ones that you think need government's protection from you know bad corporations they're going to rip them off okay so the same thing with medicine even if we assume the government really could do a good job of picking you know ranking doctors from the best down to quacks and the government's just going to pick some line and say it's illegal for a doctor in the u.s to be of this inferior level of quality it's not as obvious as you might initially have thought that that's helping people because again clearly one way that the substandard doctors compete is by <coughs> being cheaper and so you, you might it might mean so yes you're weeding out people from giving shoddy medical service but you're also making it hard for some poor people to get treatment at all perhaps okay okay next one okay another thing 
I just want to explain why is it, in this slide I'm going to explain, why is it that health insurance tends to go hand in hand with employment in the U.S. So one big thing was there were price and wage controls in World War II. And so the, the, in World War II, the government spent a lot of money, and part of how they paid for it was the Federal Reserve was creating new money and buying government bonds. So that, that all these new dollars being printed, metaphorically, were pushing up prices. And so part of what the government did is they just passed laws limiting how fast could prices rise to try to contain that so the public wouldn't you know, freak out about, geez, you know, butter is 80% more expensive this year than last year. That's outrageous. The government just passed laws telling merchants you can't raise prices too rapidly in, in order, you know, if you think about it, so if a business isn't allowed to raise its prices too much, but the wages it has to pay its employees are rising much more rapidly, how is it, how's it going to be profitable? How is it going to stay in business? So the government also applied the controls to wages. So it was illegal for you know, a company to try to bid away workers from another company, its rival, by giving them a 30% raise. You couldn't do that. It was illegal. So what businesses started doing to attract quality employees is they said, oh, well, in addition to the salary we'll give you, we'll also pay your health insurance premiums. And so it was here where that became a standard thing because the government ruled that's not a violation of the price or the wage control statutes. You can go ahead and give fringe benefits. That doesn't count as you pay more. Okay, so that's partly how that just became a standard thing. And then it got locked into the tax code. So here, it's kind of a technical point, but if you get into this debate, it's, it's a pretty significant one. The way it works right now, if your employer just gives you $100,000 salary, and then you use that to go pay partially for your health insurance, you get taxed the full 100,000. You know, you as a worker, you get to pay income tax then. If your employer gives you $85,000 in base salary and then pays $15,000 on your behalf to get a really nice health insurance package for you and your family every year, that $15,000 from the employer's point of view is still an expense, so the employer doesn't you know, pay corporate income tax on that, that's a deductible expense, but you, the employee, on your when you report to the IRS, only pay tax on the 85,000 base salary. That 15 grand they're spending on your behalf is not taxable income to you. Okay, so for people in high tax brackets, that's actually a lot of money, right? If you were gonna go buy health insurance anyway, that, that's a lot of money. But the problem with that is, because of that quirk in the tax code, it does lock in this thing where your employer tends to be the one paying for it. So again, you get this problem where you, the, the patient, are not really the one making the, the spending decisions. It's not your money that you're paying for health and care, it's your employer's paying it on your behalf and they have a big group plan. Okay, go ahead. Okay, so uh, you go ahead, next one. We're running a long time, let me keep going here. Next. Okay, uh, another main thing here in terms of why are, now I'm gonna talk about why are, why are drugs, pharmaceuticals so expensive. The big culprit here I'm gonna claim is the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration. So up until 1962, the FDA, that, you know, this, this thing that regulates new drugs in the United States, all it did was it had a, a safety criteria. You had to, if you were a pharmaceutical company, you wanted to bring a new drug to market, you had to demonstrate to the FDA that it was safe. It, it's safe, you know, there's no such thing as a totally safe drug, but you know, they had definitions and tests you had to do to, so it was a, a minimum level of safety. After what's called the, uh, hang on a second, after the, with the thalidomide tragedy, do you, do you guys know what thalidomide, what, what that was? Okay. Do you know Billy Joel? <laughs> okay, so he's got the he's got the song We Didn't Start the Fire. One of the lyrics in there is Children of the Little Mind. Dun, dun, dun. See, I told you I gave a karaoke. Um, so anyway, he, he refers it. What happened is there was this uh, drug that was it would like allow sleeping. It, it was like a sleep aid, and I think it was also for mothers who are expected mothers who had morning sickness would take this. And in Europe, it led to a lot of birth defects, right? So, so expecting mothers who were taking this drug, thalidomide, you know, the baby would be born with, with uh, bad def birth defects. It, it wasn't a, a problem in the U.S. It was never approved for commercial distribution in the U.S. Some doctors were allowed to give it, you know, as like free samples or whatever, but there, there weren't, it wasn't a major problem here, but it was in Europe. And so, you know, people were really concerned. So in 62, the FDA changed its rule and said, in addition to being safe, now drug companies have to prove to us 
that their products are efficacious. So we don't, we don't have time to get into here, but this is a great example of how when there's a, a problem, you know, a terrible thing happens, and the politicians go to do something, even though it doesn't, even on its own terms, solve the problem at hand. So here, the issue was not that thalidomide wasn't good at helping you sleep through the night, it was that it had a really bad side effect that people didn't realize. So there was no, you know, they, and also the FDA didn't screw up here. The person who denied the application from this particular drug company got a medal from, I think it was from JFK, um, you know, awarding them, saying, good job, you kept Americans safe from this thing, look what happened in Europe. So it's weird that the FDA, you know, worked on its own terms, and then they totally revamped it, it gave it more power and, you know, a bigger budget, even though technically what they changed would not have done anything, even if they had left the, the little mind. But in any event, that's the, go ahead. Um, and so here, the standard way economists explain that the, the drawback of the FDA is kind of like that Cadillac analogy. They're going to say, so, so right now, just so you know, for a new, for a pharmaceutical to bring a new drug to market, it can cost a billion dollars, billion with a B, in research and development to go through all the clinical trials and things like that. And so that's partly why if you wonder, you know, when you get pres a prescription, you go to get a fill that's so expensive, and that's why you need your insurance to help you pay for it. And you've seen like some of these cancer treatments and other types of treatments are ludicrously expensive. And this is partly why, because the drug companies have to spend literally a billion dollars or more of when all is told to bring these things to market. So they have to charge a high amount just to cover their R&D costs. And part of why that is, geez, why is it so expensive? Is it just, that's the nature of science? Well, no, part of it is because of, of the FDA having all of these procedures in place that you have to go through. So again, it's, it's a trade-off. Yes, you, you might be weeding out potentially dangerous drugs, but that means anything that survives that process, that vetting process, is now gonna have to be really expensive. Okay, beyond that, though, so that, what I just said there, that's a standard thing economists would say when they're saying here's some of the drawbacks of having a really uh, conservative FDA. But there's another problem, so that's why I'm saying it's sins of omission and commission. We don't have time to get into it here, but if you go, if you're interested in this, go look up, you can type in Vioxx scandal, and you can see that Vioxx was approved by the FDA, and then eventually the manufacturer yanked it voluntarily because it was, it was causing lots of deaths. And so that it's a scandal in the sense that there's one of the guys who used to work for the FDA came forward and said he was trying to warn them this is unsafe, and you know he was quashed. He tried to publish something in a, in a medical journal and got quashed. So anyway, there's there's allegations here that it's the problem is not merely that oh we have drugs that are super safe but they're too expensive. It's also that because the FDA is blessing drugs, the public assumes they're safe. And so if the FDA is wrong, then you know something might be out there for a long time because it's got the endorsement from the U.S. government. Everyone assumes it's safe. All right. So there's that problem also that don't just assume because the FDA is there that's like an extra layer of security if they do a bad job it's actually perverse it's you know the worst of both worlds that the drugs that we have are more expensive than they need to be and they might be really dangerous okay okay beyond that there's just some really silly anecdotes and things of you know the FDA is a government agency and just like if you've been studying these sorts of things, they do a lot of goofy things where the, you know, the rules are applied in a silly fashion. So there's cases where this one commissioner came in and he had like press conferences and stuff where his agents raided a, a warehouse and got a bunch of orange juice and just smashed it and dumped like thousands of gallons of orange juice. So it was sort of like, you know, back up during Prohibition when, they, when the government and the G-men would go in and, and, and you know, smash open all the kegs and, and get the beer out. And because there, the, the problem was, it's not that the orange juice was poisonous, it's that it was called, like, uh, Nature's Fresh was, like, the name of the, you know, that, that type, and it was from concentrate. And it's, it's set on the package from concentrate, but the FDA thought it was, that type was too small and might mislead people into thinking it wasn't from concentrate, and so they destroyed, the, you know, thousands of gallons of orange juice. Um, they have... Uh, regulations in place for how you can advertise and so for example for for aspirin let me do that one first there was um, growing evidence that if you took aspirin it would prevent or help prevent a first heart attack and they realized that you know aspirin was originally developed you know for pain relief but they realized these other, these other benefits possibly in preventing a heart attack 
and so um, they couldn't they couldn't advertise that though because that particular use had not been through an FDA approval, right? And so the aspirin companies they would just print on the label or the commercials they would say, ask your doctor about other benefits of whatever Tylenol or whatever the, whatever the thing was, but they couldn't say what they were, and so that was the way they had to get around it because they couldn't tell you what the benefits were. And what was, it was a weird catch-22 where they, they could, you might say, well, why didn't they just go through the FDA trials? They couldn't because it would have been medically unethical. That, in other words, the benefit here that they were talking about was so well known in the medical community that there had actually been a, a clinical trial, and as they were going through it, the benefit, you know how they had like a placebo group and a, and, um, you know, the, the test group, the ones that get the treatment, the results were so good for the treatment group, they stopped the trial midway through to start giving the aspirin to the you know the placebo group because they realized we can't let them not get this, we see how effective it is. So they couldn't actually do what the FDA said, you would need to do this, this, and this for us to you know have a controlled experiment to sign off on this being safe to advertise because it would have been unethical. They could have lost their licenses from other regulations if they did what the FDA asked them to do. So now they couldn't tell consumers what the benefits were, they just had to cryptically say, ask your doctor about other potential benefits from using this. Um, as far as the Rogaine thing, they had a, th a deal where um, if you wanted to just do an advertisement for a product but you didn't want to list all of the you know, legalese and all the different possible side effects, you could just do commercials with name brand branding, but you couldn't say what the product was for. Okay, so that, that was the FDA's rule. They're saying, we understand you know, with advertisements sometimes you might want to just have a smaller budget campaign, you know, have a quick ad in a newspaper or a magazine, just to, to you know, have people lock into that, the, your name brand without going through all the disclosure. So you're allowed to do that, but then you can't say what it's for. You're just advertising for the name brand recognition. And so there was a Rogaine commercial where the actor, you know, he's out there about, you know, ask your doctor about Rogaine, but he couldn't say what it was for. It's, it's for hair loss. And not that I know about that, anyway. Um, and the actor then like just scratched his head like that. And the FDA came in and said they gotta reshoot the scene because by him doing that, you're letting people know this is about hair. And so they had to reshoot the scene. Okay, so just some real goofy things like that. Another example, um, you, if you see, you know, see these, they're real popular now, but I remember, you know, I'm older than most of you guys, and so I remember when these things started becoming popular, they, they didn't used to do this, but these commercials for various drugs, and they'll show like, an older couple you know, riding their, their 10 speed bike around and you know being real happy and everything. It's, and they'll say stuff like, you know, they'll have a speed reader come on at the end and be like, peroxin may cause, you know, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, three arms to grow. He'll speed read a bunch of possible things that could go wrong. And you're wondering, like, why are they paying to tell the public about how horrible this thing could be? And, and, and so, like I said, I noticed when those, you know, they might be, it might be commonplace, but there were, they didn't used to do that, right? They didn't used to have commercial like that. At some point, they started doing it. I remember wondering, why are they paying to tell people this might give you diarrhea? Why would it? But it's because you hear that now all the time, so you just tune it out, right? You know, oh, well, they have to say that because anything could cause anything. And, oh, well, maybe I will try this. It looks like, you know, I can ride intensity with my grandma. Good. And, and so, paradoxically, by them having those, so clearly they, there must be some regulation, right? A company not, would not normally pay for a speed reader to come out at the end and list all these horrible things that might happen if you use their product. There's clearly regulations forcing them to do that if they want to have a commercial. And so by them thinking, oh, we're just giving people more information, it's the opposite. They're getting flooded with so much information with no context. Now nobody really knows, gee, is this thing potentially really dead? You don't know, because if every possible product says it might cause these 15 things that are horrible. And so you really can't tell. So that's just an example of the uh, intervention going the wrong way. Okay, go ahead. I'll, let me speed up here. Keep going. Uh, keep going. Keep going. Go. Go. Keep. Yep. 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 Okay. Let me let me stop right here for a second. So I just so I want to speed up and get to the last slide to give you some free market alternatives and then give you good times uh, time for questions. So here, as far as the Affordable Care Act. Um, and on the previous slide, there's stuff Ronald Reagan did. So hospitals, the fact that hospital, you show up, you know, with a gunshot wound, a hospital can't turn you away. They can't say, well, how are you gonna pay for this? Do you have insurance? They can't, legally, they can't do that. And that was signed into law in the Reagan administration. So this is not me bashing on Democrats. It's, oh, it's just Democrats, but it's, it's a bipartisan thing. Everybody wants to look good on, you know, 
expanding health care treatment. Um, and that is, Mitt Romney, of course, had what they called Romney care. So it's, it's ironic that he was the one running against uh, you know, Obamacare. When, so anyway, so but me focusing here on, on Obamacare, it's not I'm bashing Democrats. It's a bipartisan thing, but just the interest of time. Let me point this out. So there's lots of potential downsides to the Affordable Care Act, you know, popularly called Obamacare. But here, look at this middle one. Let me just focus on that for a second. So the, the, the nature of the Affordable Care Act is everybody who applies for health insurance has to get it. Right? That's what it is. It's, it's universal coverage. It's guaranteeing everybody. Nobody can be denied. Right? That's the whole point. And so clearly, though, there are some people the health insurance company is going to lose money on them. Right? Somebody who's got a pre, somebody who's got cancer. You, and also, Obamacare, you can't charge them more. The insurance company can't say, okay, yeah, you got a brain tumor. Yeah, we'll give you a policy, but it'll cost $80,000 a year. It will cap your medical reimbursements at $70,000 a year. They, they can't do that. That would be illegal. That would be, that'd be a, a farce, right? So what ends up happening is for those people with very expensive medical conditions, they're just walking time bombs for the health insurance company. They're, they're guaranteed money losers. So the health insurance companies don't want them applying to their company. They want them going somewhere else. So what they, partly what they did after the Affordable Care Act went into force, so if you're a health insurance company, you could just say, okay, in our area, in this region that we're covering, who are the best cancer doctors? You know, like just what, if, if, I, if somebody has cancer, how would they go about and look for the best cancer doctor? Let's make sure those doctors are out of network so that when the people are shopping around to see which health insurance plan do I want, people with cancer are not picking our plan, right? We want people picking our plan who go to the gym every week and have nothing wrong with them. That's the kind of people we want to attract, okay? So that's partly, so these things started happening. So there was perverse cases where after the Affordable Care Act went into effect. So yes, there were a lot of people before who hadn't gotten health insurance at all that, that benefited. So don't misunderstand me. I'm not saying there aren't winners and losers, but part of what happened that was an unintended consequence, people who had had good health care, you know, from, you know, they had insurance and everything, all of a sudden their plans changed and they, they couldn't keep going to their doctor. Right? That's the famous, you can keep your doctor if you want to think that, so that's partly what happened. And again, when you think it through, of course, that's an obvious uh, result. Okay. Okay. So let me just spend a couple minutes here, then I'll take your questions at the end. For, I've gone through and shown all the different ways that government intervention has kept this from not being a market, and I've tried to, I hope to show you some of the downsides of it, but we can also see in the real world examples of how markets work in healthcare delivery the way they do, you know, with plasma screen TVs or computers, right? With uh, big screen TVs and computers, what's the, the pattern? Over, you know, they, when they first come out, they're really expensive, and over time they keep getting cheaper, and the quality keeps improving. You do see that pattern when it comes to stuff that's out of pocket, right? So like LASIK eye surgery, you know, when that first came out, it was very expensive, and then over time it got cheaper. Um, things like another, like, uh, like plastic surgery, things that are purely elective, where they're not covered by your insurance, and this is you're paying out of pocket for this thing that you want, you're the customer, and it's a business transaction. Those things actually are, are quite, um, capitalistic, right? The, there's not a long wait. You go to the clinic; it's very nice inside. It's not this, you know. Um, it's not like it doesn't feel like a hospital. You know, you're in and you're out. You're, it's you know, boom, 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 and it's not a crazy price. And like you say, it's cheaper over time. And so you, you do see those markets, but it's typically where again you're in control as the patient, as the customer, and you're paying, you know, writing a check, for example. And, and there's not a third-party system that pays for the majority of it. That's where it looks like a normal market. Um, there's this idea of concierge medicine, so I don't have time to get into it here. If you want to learn more about it, though, Google um, Free Market Medical Association, for example. That's a, an organization, a trade association of medical professionals who agree with these principles. And you can see case studies or um, the Surgery Center of Oklahoma. Go look at them and their pricing. They, they have a model where um, you, know, you just pay an annual fee to be in, in their network or in their system, and then you go in for standard procedures, they give it to you, it's, it's cash, right? So, that, so that's partly how they save money. When I say save money, it's like they'll give you drugs at about a 95% discount to what you know, other, other doctors would charge you for, okay? Because they get it right at wholesale, 
And if you're wondering, you know, how, how can they afford to do that? It's because right now when you go to your doctor or if you go to the ER or something, if they give you a bill for $1,000 for, you know, some visit that took, you know, a half an hour of people's time, it's $1,000. Partly they do that because they know a lot of people are just never paying that. And so they have to have a whole team of people who just do paperwork, who deal with insurance companies. Maybe six months down the road, somebody will give them $200 for that. So they have to charge, you know, the $1,000 upfront sticker fee because really it costs them, let's say, $150 to do it. Okay, but if you just are there armed with your checkbook and say, I'll pay you right now, well, oh, okay, well, yeah, this will give it to you for 200 Okay, so that's how they can afford to do this because the official charges right now are inflated because they know, for example, that a lot of the people just aren't going to pay, period. Okay, go ahead. Okay, next one. Um, so another thing, again, I'm so here, but a little bit more radical. So the stuff I just said, that, that's really happening in the real world. Now I'm telling you stuff that would be a change. Uh, get rid of the FDA or at least make it voluntary. So what I mean is, if you still want the FDA telling people its opinion about drugs, okay, but just say if, if you want to buy something that the FDA hasn't approved, you should have the right to do that. You know, if the FDA is there just providing information, they can still give their guidance, but don't make it illegal for someone to buy something the FDA didn't approve. On this point, there's this uh, subscription magazine called Best Pills, Worst Pills, and we talked about it in this, the book that I did with the ER doctor, Prime Prescription, and it showed that um, as of when the book came out, this was it came out like four years ago, but as of that, when we did the manuscript and turned that in, all of the times that the FDA had initially approved a drug and then changed its mind and yanked it, this subscription magazine predicted it ahead of time. So in other words, the, the, the people who contributed to this magazine knew the FDA screwed up on all these products. They should not have approved They're going to change their mind eventually. So the point here is there's nothing magical about working for the FDA that makes you know more medicine than somebody else. You know, they're real people. They can make mistakes. And the problem with the FDA, though, is it's awkward when they do make a mistake because then for them to admit they are wrong, you know, that there's inertia. If instead you just had voluntary certification organizations, there'd be competition. And if, if one of them kept screwing up, people would stop listening to it. Okay, next slide. Okay, get rid of state medical licensure and have private certification. So here, I know that sounds perhaps radical to people, but again, just think it through. So just because the state is allowing companies to hire doctors without getting a license, that doesn't mean there wouldn't be medical school, right? So if you're running a hospital and you have an opening for a brain surgeon and someone walks in, you're not just going to hire him because of his winning smile. You're going to say, did you go to medical school? Let me see the diploma. And if he went, you know, to some school you never heard of, that's from, you know, some the Bahamas or something, and it's it's you know, uh, quack you, you're not going to hire that person, right? You're, if you went to a reputable medical school, so you know, where to you do your residency? So hospitals can still do all that stuff. They can still have procedures in place. It's just they don't need the government on top of all that to say, ah, right, we also sign off on that person. Okay, so again, I just would urge you to get out of the habit of thinking you need the government there to tell the world who's a good doctor or not, it's actually other doctors who make that decision. Even the government, you know, the politicians don't know who a good brain surgeon is. They rely on expert advisors and then, you know, they form committees and panels for the licensing boards made up of other doctors, right? So it's ultimately other doctors doing it. It's just when it's through the government, it's more of a cartel. Okay, uh, one more. Okay, last thing, and I'll stop here, is just to give you something real radical, but where it has an incredible, you know, tangible, Results. So it's not. I'm not just talking up here saying, "Oh, wow, think of all the money we can save." Or GDP growth would be 3.6 percent. No, there's thousands of people every year. Five to ten thousand people die because they don't get a kidney transplant. And that that problem, that shortage of kidneys, could be solved immediately if you just allow for people to get paid to donate their kidneys. Right. So every year, more than enough people die and go into the ground with functioning kidneys that could have been you know, used, you know, because how they died didn't hurt their kidneys. And they could solve this problem in a year or two. You know, they could, they could get it up and running and get deal with the backlog such that going forward, people who need kidney transplants could get it just from cadaverous donors. Okay, and then also if you want, you could have live donors too. But the point is there's there's procedures, you know, there's, there's proposals in place where they run the numbers and just, so the idea is, it would just have to be a thing where you, you check and say, right, right now, if you want to, you can be an organ donor. You get a car accident or something, they can, you can have a thing on your license. But what if beyond that it said, 
you know, if my kidneys are viable, I get them, you know, I'll contribute them and get $10,000 each that goes to my estate. So in your will, you'd have an extra $20,000 to donate. A lot more people would agree to that, if that kind of payment, yet that's illegal. Because, oh, that's icky, you don't want people paying for organs, that sounds gross to a lot of people, okay, but because of that rule, that means five to 10,000 people die every year on dialysis because they didn't get a transplant. So again, this idea of you know, having more markets in medicine and getting rid of uh, government interference, it's not just that old prices would come down and we'd be richer, there'd be a lot more people alive because you know, people really are dying from these limitations. Okay, uh, thanks for your attention, I'll stop there. So, uh, Kim, just shut us off when you need to. I, I realize I went longer than I meant to, okay. so if you need to leave, go ahead, but I'll stay here until Kim shuts me up. Yeah? A lot of politicians are talking about like, socialized medicine. I, I lived in China for 10 years, and in China, they have 75% of your health care is paid by the government, and 15% like, is paid by your employer, 10% is paid by you. But if you don't have, if you're retired and you're not working then 100% of your health care is covered by the government, they don't seem to have the same problems we have with uh, affordable health care. And you're talking about the MDA and medical, uh, the cost of medical research. In China, they got private companies doing medical research. Um, and it's much more affordable um, because they don't have the regulations that we have. My question is, uh, socialized medicine, uh, why can't the United States have similar types of health care that, that other countries have, like Sweden, mm -hmm. uh, they have socialized medicine? Would, um, for your opinion, would that be a good thing for the United States, or would you see that as, as something negative? Okay, yeah, so, uh, just, I'll, I'll, I'll answer a, a few things here and hopefully get at least the, the basics of my response. So as far as, so yeah, you're, let me deal with your last thing first. It's this very typical thing in this debate for people to say, what are you talking about? Socialized, you know, they have socialized medicine in a lot of European places, Scandinavian countries, and by many measures, you know, their performance, you know, their healthcare indicators are comparable, if not better, to the U.S., and they spend a lot less. So what, you know, so a, a couple of things. One is, um, some of those comparisons like on, on life expectancy and things like that are, are a bit misleading. I, I'm not gonna be able to rattle off like this, like which country measures it which way, but I have seen analyses where in the US, if a baby's born, period, it goes into the life expectancy figures where in some other places they wait, like if it's premature, like it has to survive a certain amount or else it doesn't count as a live birth. So because of that difference, it, it lowers the life expectancy in the US, but it's not an apples to apples. There's another thing, so here this might sound funny to you, but if you take aside the car accidents and gunshot homicides, the U.S. actually has a much better life expectancy than many places, right? So I'm not saying USA, USA, but it's not really the fault of the U.S. medical healthcare system that we have more car accidents and more gun homicides than other countries. So you know, we can talk about why is that, and that's not a good thing, but I'm saying partly those comparisons there are some things in there that um, it's not really apples to apples. Uh, as far as the doctors and things like that, again, I don't know the exact specifics for the Chinese system per se, but in a lot of these countries, doctors are, are paid by the government or it's regulated, so they don't earn. So you know how here, it's, it's less and less every year, but you know, it's the thing about, oh, you know, somebody who's a doctor makes a lot of money. In a lot of these places, that's, it's not like that. It's more of just a standard job. Like here, it's not like nurses don't make a ton of money in some countries, like that's true even of, of doctors. And so that's that's partly why the costs are low, but then it's also why you're not gonna get as many people going into it. And clearly, you know, the wait times for a lot of these countries, like, you know, especially like in Canada, as I have more, um, you know, I'm more familiar with that data, but there's plenty of standard elective procedures, especially like somebody needs a hip replacement or something like that, where they're waiting for a really long time in Canada. A lot of times they'll just come south of the border to get it done here, even though, wow, that's outrageously expensive. I can't believe how much you Americans have to pay for healthcare, but they, they get it. They're not on a waiting list for six months. So there are some trade-offs. In the United States, the, the addiction rate is like 
higher than any other country in the world. And their prescription medication uh, that most people are starting to get addicted to. In China, like, you can buy medication over the counter that you can in the United States. Right. And their addiction rate is much lower than that, ours. Um, I think, uh, I think they're saying that the pharmaceutical companies made a fortune on oxycodone right. and yeah. some of these other medications that you could just buy over the counter in China. Right, so I, I don't claim that I know exactly why the opioid, I think like partly it's like there's despair and we can talk about why is that and people are slowly committing suicide via other methods. Uh, but, but yeah, but just real briefly, notice there, um, in these other places where they don't have the regulations in place where they allow for generics, that it's a, right now, I don't know if you guys know this, but like there's certain drugs, like so the U.S. pharmaceutical company will develop a drug, sell it here domestically, for a you know whatever I mean, two hundred dollars a bottle of pills, and then we'll sell it in Europe for five dollars a bottle. Okay, and it's illegal to reimport it. Now the now the rationale is because they need to recoup their R and D. If they if they sold it for five dollars to everybody, they just wouldn't develop it in the first place. Okay, so that's why the system is the way it is. But I you know, agree with you, and I'm, I'm just pointing out. Notice there that's a case where it's not that oh there's socialized medicine in China. The government has a big role. That, no, what's going on there is the U.S. government is the one making it so expensive. So again, it's um, the, the U.S. is not this paragon of laissez-faire. There's a mixture. There's a lot of private spending going on, but there's a lot of government restriction. Yep, in the back. Uh, so if you had to pin down a reason for why people aren't generally supportive of free market healthcare solutions, what do you think it would be? Do you think it's lack of understanding? Do you think it's general, like, actual hostility? Like, what do you, what do you think? I think it's a couple things. So I think one is... People feel like health, you know, as opposed to like going to the movies or something, people feel like no healthcare is a right. They might say, I think Bernie Sanders says it. So it's it, it's kind of like with education too, where people think that's not something that, you know, oh, people who make enough money can go afford healthcare. Like that strikes them as horrifying. So I think there's that element. And also, I think people believe that, oh, what we have in the US, this is market provided healthcare because you, you are, you know, you're face to face with the companies. And, you know, health insurance companies are annoying. I mean, if, heaven forbid you have to call the, their customer service and have them change something, you're going through menus and whatever. And by the way, that, again, I'm not trying to blame the government for everything, but that's an understandable response, right? If, part, you know, Affordable Care Act and other interventions make it so they have to have customers that they're losing money on, one way they save money is, they, you know, they have, in other words, because of the Affordable Care Act, there's plenty of people who are buying this product that the company wishes didn't have to sell it to them. So you have a line of people wanting this product, the company doesn't want it, so how do they do it? They partly, well, let's save money, let's not have as many people work in the phones. You know what I mean? Because people get mad and go somewhere else, it comes like, good, I don't want them here. Okay, I mean, I'm being serious. So this isn't just some quirk of fate, like, oh, yep, that's the world for you. No, that's what happens when you have this weird mixture of technically private companies still but with massive government regulations on what they're allowed to do with their business model. So I think that's part of it too, that people look at this and they, they're dealing with private companies and that's capitalism, this isn't working. And it would take a long you know, time to, to walk through and see what's going on. And also again, the, the companies involved are doing, in a lot of cases, shady practices. So I'm not saying, oh, these are angels and the government's forcing them to be bad. I'm saying the type of companies that thrive in this regulated market are not the ones that I think would thrive in a different way. Like these, like these doctors in the Free Market Medical Association, if you go check out their websites, I mean, they, I, I think, you know, the, the ones there that I've interacted with, I just gave a talk at their conference, you know, they're really committed to patient care and so on, and, you know, giving value to their customers. They're, they're looking at it like it's a business. Other questions? Do, um, the plus report, it has yeah. such a big impact on the medical profession because they closed down so many schools, they restricted, uh -huh. you know, why was that report even conducted? Um, I think the, I think his name is Alexander um, Flexter. He it, it's been a while since I've looked at that particular uh, history, but I, I think he was just you know uh, concerned about the state of. In other words, you know this is back in 1900. There were a lot of you know snake oil salesmen. You know those those phrases we have. There really were people going around with carnival barkers and selling potions and things to people that this will fix your ailments and what have you. So there was a lot of shady stuff going on. And so I, I 
think in his case, you know, he, he might have had altruistic motives. Also, in terms of picking up steam, so the other medical professionals, the ones who thought, oh, we're going to make the cut, they, of course, benefit if the government makes it illegal, you know, knocks out their competition who, you know, have to undercut them with low prices because they're not as reputable. So, and, and by the way, you see this a lot, like, um, just so you guys, there's things like if you want to braid hair a certain way, you have to get a license. Okay, so this idea of licensure and the people who are on the committee, um, you know, that they, they, or I know my, my fiance works um, in the massage sector, and so she has a license for that, and then she wanted to be able to paint the toes, you know, of her clients, and she couldn't do that because, you know, she had to go to a certain amount of schooling to be allowed to paint people's toes. Yeah, the you know? same thing happened, the, the braid example, it was an African-American woman, and at most of the schools, they didn't teach, they, you know, where she right. was certified, they didn't even teach hair braiding. Right. So, yeah, that tends to happen. And, it's, and so, yeah, so just so you get the train of thought there, the, so the point is the people on those boards, just, just think about it, the government's gonna have a board to decide who's qualified in this community to perform these services so the public's not you know, getting ripped off or getting substandard quality. It's gotta be other, you know, so for the, uh, the massage boards, other people in the sector. You know, they're the ones that they've been in the industry a while and they get elected, I don't know how they get out of board, they, maybe the board approves and bring them on. So it's in their interest to deny who else can do this. Right, so the people who are you know, in charge of hair salons and who can become and, and start braiding hair a certain way, it's in their interest to say, no, you can't do that because that excludes competition. So the same thing, so again, I'm not saying anyone who's involved with any of these things is corrupt, but it's a bad system where you're making decisions that if you exclude certain people, then you get more market share. Yep, sir. Yeah, can I say a few words about the budget report, please? Sure. Uh, <clears throat> my name's Bill Baldino. I'm a physician. Okay. I'm a fellow of the American College of Surgeons. I'm not a physician anymore. Um, uh, and I'm enjoying it. <laughs> but the Flexner Report grew out of a dissatisfaction with the quality of medical care in the United States at the early part of the 20th century. There was Zippo control. You had basically, you could go to a legitimate university-based accredited medical school. Mm -hmm. There were proprietary free market. Okay, right. and trust me, I am not a socialist. Okay, okay, but there's there's a danger in complete unbridled capitalism. Also, okay, there was um, there were proprietary medical schools where basically if you paid them enough money, you sat there for a little while and they gave you told you you were a doctor. Mm -hmm. And even more shocking, you could do on the job training. Right. Dr. Murphy, you can come with Dr. Baldino, and I sweep my floors for a few months, and I tell you a couple of things, and I don't know, after a little while, I say, yeah, you're a doctor, and right. you can go out and practice medicine. So they kind of, you're an economist. Flexner was actually an economist, and I believe it was, if I remember correctly, it was the uh, Rockefeller Foundation that paid for this study. <laughs> And uh, he looked at us and uh, came up with these recommendations. He said that all, the, all medical schools should be university-based. He said that uh, you should have an undergraduate education with experience in several of the sciences before you got to medical school. And, um, the teachers in medical school had to be specialists, had to have doctorates and had to be specialists in the area in which they were teaching. Right. So as a surgeon, I couldn't teach an a medical oncology class. Right. Okay. Yes, a lot of medical schools closed. They were the bad ones. No question about it. Okay. They were the ones that were the proprietary medical schools. He eliminated the OJT. And it was with the Flexner Report that the quality of American healthcare began improving. We were a backwater at the beginning of the 20th century. Pardon me? Okay. We were a backwater at the beginning of the 20th century, and 
from then on we began improving. Undoing the Flexner report would definitely would be a complete disaster. You know, it's a it's a way of maintaining. Uh, I'm not undoing it, but many of the steps now. Can the government intrude too much? Absolutely. Okay. Yeah. So and, and thank you there that, you know, that for filling in the details. So I think the takeaway is don't trust any economist who comes in because he's saying Flexner was an economist. No, um, he's trustworthy. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so yeah, let me just real briefly, then we'll, we'll let you guys uh, get out of here if you need to go. Um, I, again, though, I mean, just push it to its extreme, though. I mean, you because again, in the year 1910, there were a lot of poor people, especially in rural areas, and maybe what that meant was, yeah, the doctors they were seeing weren't very good, but maybe that was better than not seeing a doctor at all. And if if the doctors disappeared because now you know that was illegal for the, that low quality. It might mean they don't see a doctor at all. Or yeah, there is a doctor that you could drive or ride a horse ten miles to go see, but now it's pretty expensive. Whereas before it was cheap. So just to put it the extreme, right now, if you say who are the best ten percent of doctors in the U.S. and let's make it illegal for anybody less than that to practice medicine, <coughs> you, know, you could exaggerate. It's not obvious. You know, the, you, we, unambiguously, the quality of medical care would go up if we just looked at the best ten percent of doctors right now and said starting next year there are only them or better allowed. It's not obvious that that would be a good thing, though. Maybe so. It's, it sounds like a weird thing to say, but this is the kind of thing economists would say a lot. It's maybe the quality was too high, right? In the sense of because the price goes up, so it's it's not obvious. So again, I'm not at all minimizing. I'm sure there were real shady practices and things that were outlawed, but it also is possible there were decent treatments that were worth what they were charging their patients. That now maybe those patients weren't seeing people at all. Okay, thanks for your attention, guys, and I'll be sticking around.
It's the same principle as a horse. They were just coming. Okay. Yeah? <laughs> I used to tell the time because I'd go to paint farms and, and people used to love the crazy glue, the dial touch pad on the, on the paint phone near the high school. And so no one would be able to make a call, except I knew I could just pick it up and dial on the switch button. <laughs> so they would have been like, what is, how does this crazy person make a call? At least once. At least once. Yes. Yes. Right. Right. Uh, you don't have to worry about it now, but wait until Trump plunges, plunges us into the new dark age where we can't trade her China for electronics anymore. Ah, we're all going to go back to landlines with embroidery lines. Visual science. My ham radio license is about to come in. Well, that's exactly what I was thinking. Yeah. Well, at least that we know of that. We have to put a lot of our people in.